Well, I want to thank you very much for uh, having this today. Um, a little bit about the LDA. We're volunteer run th for 32 years, and about 95% of our funds go directly to our programs. We've awarded 123 research grants to date, and our research has been shown up in 60 journal publications. We've given out 159 educational grants to organizations, and we have a special Lime Made for Kids program uh, for children who require medical help and their families are uh, economically disadvantaged. And uh, we are working on our 22nd uh, Continuing Medical Education Conference with Columbia University that will be held in October. And um, basically, we partner with about 40 U.S. organizations across the country and the Environmental uh, Protection Agency in their PESP program against ticks. And I've testified uh, twice before two different House committees in D.C., and I was invited to uh, the uh, Fort Collins, the Vector-Borne Disease Division, twice um, over time to present to them about Lyme disease. And uh, our website has a lot of great information on it. Now, in 2007, we were able to, with a partner in Connecticut, we established the Columbia Lyme and Tick-Borne Diseases Research Center, and they've done some fabulous research, especially dealing with our children. <clears throat> Now, Lyme disease is found in more than 80 countries. And as I probably don't have to tell you, Pennsylvania has been uh, number one in reported cases now for quite a number of years. And these are maps that we produce uh, as soon as the CDC com comes out with their latest numbers. And uh, for example, 2019, that's the last official numbers out of CDC. And you can find them online, you can uh, print them out, use them, hang them up, do whatever you want for free. And if you click on your state online, what you will find is you will see uh, something like this. To the left hand there, it shows the table of your numbers from 1990 through 2019. Um, and so it's a, it's a great learning tool. Now, the Lyme Disease Association also produces a graph uh, using CDC um, information. And what we've shown for 2001 to 2017, that adults 20 to 90 plus years make up 71% of cases, whereas our children, zero to 19, made up 29% of cases. And the born and unborn are affected by Lyme because pregnant women can transmit Lyme to the fetus through the placenta. Now, it can cause death of the fetus, um, and that's why CDC definitely recommends that uh, someone who is pregnant gets treated if they do have Lyme. And there's a, still a discussion ongoing as to whether or not it can produce birth defects. Now, this is something that Fair Health, which is a, a national nonprofit, has uh, produced, and it's a great little graphic. And from 2007 to 2021, using private insurance claim lines with a Lyme disease diagnosis all in the United States, they showed in rural areas, Lyme increased 357% over that time frame, and in urban areas, 65%. Now, what about dogs, cats, and Lyme? So I want to talk about dogs first because particularly they're 50% more likely uh, to, to get Lyme because they tend to roll in the leaves, they run unchecked into, into tick habitats, and they can bring unattached ticks to the home. They can also get ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis, and in many of the dogs, they get something that causes them to develop serious kidney disease, and I know a number of dogs that have died from that. Now, cats are less likely to get Lyme. Doesn't mean they can't, but they are less likely. Um, but nonetheless, having pets is a risk and people should be aware of that. So what about canine tick-borne disease in Pennsylvania? 
Well, according to the Companion Animal Parasite Council, in their 2022 numbers, they, they get in data on testing of dogs. And in 2022 in Pennsylvania, they tested 593,959 dogs for Lyme disease. One out of 11 dogs was uh, positive. And for anaplasmosis, one out of 15. For ehrlichiosis, one out of 100. And what the CAPC says concerning its data, that this is actually less than 30% of activity in your geographic region. So what are some of the significant players in Lyme? Well, we have the reservoir hosts, and they're the ones that harbor the disease. In our area in particular, the white-footed mouse, the vole, the chipmunk, the eastern gray squirrel, the shrew, other small mammals and, and birds, certain birds, especially robin. Um, and so that, that mouse has little ticks on the top of its ears. I don't know if you can see it there, but they get covered. Um, and of course, the ticks bite the mice or the other animals, and that's how they pick up the disease. Now, the West Coast and the South, they have a couple of other different kinds of uh, animals that generally um, you know, harbor the disease. Now, what about the deer? Because we call it, in quotes, the deer tick. Well, I always tell the kids when I speak that the deer is a transport and a meal for the tick. So the female often feeds last on the deer and it mates oftentimes on the deer and then it falls off. Um, and of course, the ticks are the vectors of Lyme disease. So how do they get on us? Well, the hard-bodied ticks, which is the ones we're mostly going to talk about today, like the deer and American dog tick, they climb onto small plants and grass, and they do something called questing. They brush uh, the uh, grass, and the tick latches on. And they're what's called a passive feeder um, because they just kind of hang around and wait for you. Now, the Lone Star Tick is a nasty thing, and that will actually run after you. I've talked to guides who work in the field and uh, with tick collecting and things, and, and these Lone Stars are just amazingly fast for uh, ticks. Also, if you have any contact with the leaves or ground cover, ticks will climb up on you. They're particularly under leaves, so it's important that kids don't roll in leaf piles anymore. And of course, we have pets that carry them to people. Now, there's a soft-bodied tick I'm going to mention in, in a particular type of tick-borne disease later on. Uh, that's the orth Orthonodorus tick. They hide in animal burrows, and they're found in old cabins. Usually, a lot of them are out in the West. So a note that ticks can be active all year round now. And peak activity in Pennsylvania is from spring through May and mid-August to November, according to your Department of Health, but they can be active all year. So this is really important how a tick feeds. It secretes something to numb you and it cuts you open. Then it sticks a hollow straw-like barbed hypostome into you and it secretes a glue-like substance to cement itself to you, and then it sucks your blood. And sometimes while it's doing that, it secretes blood thinners and immune regulators into you, which is pretty uh, amazing. And during feeding, the organisms that the tick have inside it flow into you. So that's why it's so very important to do proper tick removal. So for correct tick removal, do not put anything on the tick, burn the tick, touch the tick with fingers, squeeze the tick body. I don't care what it tells you on the internet to put uh, uh, some liquid soap, do not do. The reason is if you do any of those things, it can annoy the tick, which might then inject whatever fluids it has in you and then it may be actually injecting all these organisms that it has inside you. So do use pointed tweezers, or if you have a special tick removal tool, tool that's good too, close to the skin on the head end of the tick, pull it straight out. Don't 
uh, twist or squeeze it because again, it can inject anything it has into you and it greatly increases the risk of infection. Do clean the skin area with antiseptic afterwards and you can save the tick for testing at testing labs. Um, and you preferably save it in a Ziploc with a moist cotton ball or however the testing labs may tell you to do. You can call the health, your health department or we do have certain uh, uh, information online on our website about tick testing and identification and uh, call your doctor. And if you want to permanently get rid of the tick, stick it in tape. My favorite tape is duct tape, as my husband would tell you. I duct tape everything. But you could use scotch tape, any kind of tape. Just wrap it up, can't get out. So what do we know about tick attachment time? And this is really important. The longer a tick is attached, the greater the risk of infection. So why are, is the attachment time necessary for transmission? Because generally, that the Lyme bacteria is in the mid gut of the barrel, uh, in of the tick, and there there are some researchers and scientists and the government sometimes say it takes twenty four to forty eight hours to migrate to the salivary glands of the tick. So when it bites you, it gets in you. So that's why sometimes it's said twenty eight to forty eight. However, this is not always true. And there's quite a number of research articles to show that. Sometimes bacteria are already systemic in the tick and in the salivary glands at the time of attachment. And I quote, the possibility transmission of Lyme disease spirochetes could occur within 24 hours of nymphal attachment under unusual circumstances should not be discounted. Partially fed ticks able to reattach could result from detachment from dead animals or possibly by host grooming. Now, uh, this is a study by Eisen, who uh, I believe is with the CDC. But I've uh, generally speaking, I, I cite the articles. So if you want to go back and look and find things, you can find them. So here's a map showing where the black-legged deer tick is. Um, sometimes these, these are maps from the CDC and sometimes they're a little old and so it might be slightly expanded, but this is the general gist of it. Now these are deer ticks with poppy seeds. And why do I show that? Because a poppy seed size nymph deer tick produces the most disease. And there you can see the ones that look reddish brown, the little ones are the nymph stage, and the white things in the center are the poppy seeds. Under the microscope, that's how they show up. So you can see that those ticks are actually almost smaller than those poppy seeds. Now, this is a deer tick laying eggs, ovipositing. And then this is a, the stages of the deer tick. You see the egg mass and uh, the larva, that's that white looking tick there, that tiny white looking, the nymph, which you just saw the size of the poppy seed, and the male and the female. And over to the right, you can see the engorged tick is laying the eggs. So what kind of diseases can the black-legged or deer tick transmit? They're both the same. Those are just common names for Ixodes scapularis ticks. They can transmit Borrelia burgdorferi and Borrelia maonii, both of which produce Lyme. Borrelia myomotui, Lyme-like, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, spartanolosis, or lichiosis, Powassan virus, and a tick paralysis, which is not a, uh, it, it's, it's a toxin. It's a little bit different. So I have little uh, asterisks there. And for the Bartonella, the CDC hasn't yet determined that Bartonella is tick-borne. Ticks carry it, a lot of them do, and you'll see some stats. I think I had some Pennsylvania stats there somewhere coming up. Um, and uh, a lot of scientists feel, and physicians who are treating, that it definitely, um, there's it's showing up in their Lyme patients and they feel it is tick-borne. Um, and one strain of Babesiosis, 
can be passed by trans ovarial transmission. So what does that mean? That the female tick can pass it to its, the eggs uh, if she's infected and then to the larva of the black-legged tick because with the deer tick and Lyme disease, it, that doesn't happen generally. It's not passed to the egg. Uh, so the actual, uh, the actual nymph stage has to bite the animal that we talked about, like the white-footed mouse, to get the disease. It doesn't get passed through the egg. So this is showing you the size difference between the American dog tick and the deer tick. The American dog tick, of course, the large one on the end. So the American dog tick, Dermacenter variabilis, transmits Rocky Mountain spotted fever, tularemia, and tick paralysis. And if you take a look at that map, the red shows you those are established, actual established tick populations of the uh, American dog tick in the country. And the yellow is the estimated distribution by CDC because they don't necessarily can't do every county and every area. Now, tick paralysis is thought to be caused by a toxin in the saliva of the attached tick. So people with tick paralysis can experience weakness or paralysis that generally moves up the body. And these symptoms can sometimes resemble other neurologic conditions, Guillain-Barre, botulism, and patients typically regain movement within 24 hours of removing the tick. But if you don't remove the tick, it doesn't, the paralysis does not recede. Okay, the American dog tick. This is Dermacenter variabilis, and that's the adult, female and male. And you can see the female laying eggs. It lays 4,000 to 6,000 eggs. Um, and these larvae sometimes hatch infected with Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So in other words, if the female has it, she gives it to the eggs, and then the eggs pass it along. Um, and so that's important to note because these uh, larval stages that hatch out are very extremely tiny. Now, the brown dog tick, Rephisophilus sanguineus, transmits Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Now, these ticks mainly bite dogs, but they can bite humans. And these are one of the only ticks, I think, in the United States that can actually infest homes and dog kennels. They can live their entire life in house. The other ticks can't in our country can't do that because the environment in the home, they can come in and all, but they can't pass their life cycle in there. Now, the thing about this is about five, six years ago, CDC, oh, you don't have to pay attention to the brown dog tick because they don't bite humans, they don't transmit diseases to humans. Well, guess what? They found out indeed that in the Southwest, particularly uh, on tribal lands, that they are indeed transmitting Rocky Mountain spotted fever now um, and quite a number of cases. Now the Lone Star Tick, Amblyona americane. You might remember this is the one that can, in quotes, run after you when it's out in the environment to try to, to get a meal. That transmit something called alpha-gal meat allergy, which is a, a condition which I'll talk about. Star eye, Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness. That's also called Master's Disease. Uh, tularemia, Heartland Virus, tick paralysis, which I just talked about, Q fever, ehrlichiosis, and bourbon virus. Now, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, the lone star tick is able to carry Rocky Mountain, but there's still discussion if the lone star can transmit it. There's been one case report in literature. CDC is still not willing to say it, but I have to say that, uh, you know, many people feel that it is transmissible by ticks. Okay, so this is a picture of the Lone Star Tick family right on the top. And there's two particular viruses I'm gonna say, mention first there. 
the Heartland virus. Um, and that has uh, the testing for that can be done at the CDC. And there is no treatment except supportive treatment. And you can see on that map where the cases have been. Now that probably goes back a year or so. Uh, and so um, we don't, you know, I don't know. It might have expanded a little. I couldn't find any other information. I didn't see anything about Pennsylvania having a case or anything in recent time. And then on the bottom is the Bourbon virus, and that's named after a county in uh, Kansas. Now that uh, the molecular and serologic testing can be done at the CDC, but there's other testing uh, that commercial labs can do. And uh, there's supportive therapy only. Uh, again, there's no treatment and there have been deaths reported. And as of 2017, there were 50 cases reported in mis Midwestern and Southern states. There's the three states that are, are prominently featured. Um, now, alpha-gal is an allergy to red meat and uh, it's pretty assured, though I, they don't want to say 100%, but the Lone Star is the method of uh, transmitting this. However, the, a lot of the researchers involved with alpha-gal think that other ticks now may also be involved. Now, you can't get, I cannot find a government map, but this is called Z-maps, and people actually write in and say they got it in then they plug in a little place. So I thought it shows, uh, you know, across the world that alpha-gal is certainly progressing. <clears throat> now the Gulf Coast tick, Amblyona maculatum, that transmits something called rickettsia parkeri rickettsiosis. And that's in the same grouping, CDC groups them together uh, as a uh, cluster that, caught, that are caused by rickettsiosis. So the Gulf Coast, look at the map of the Gulf Coast tick, and it is now found in Pennsylvania. I have the note under it. The established populations were found there in 2022 and at least one PA tick was positive for Rickettsia parkeri. And that was said through a uh, advisory by the Pennsylvania Department of Health. And also uh, the Gulf Coast tick has now established populations in New Jersey in 2022. So it's definitely moving along. Now, what are the signs and symptoms of Rickettsia parkeri rickettsiosis? It has an inoculation S-char, it fever, headache, muscle aches, rash, um, and the diagnosis, there are testing. I'm not going to get into what they are, but there's some of them are listed there. And general lab findings can show up and, and distinguish this mild leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, and mild uh, hepatat hepatic transaminase. Now, the Rocky Mountain wood tick, Dermacenter andersoni, transmits Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Colorado tick fever, tick paralysis. Q fever, and tularemia. Now you can see that that tick is located uh, in the far west. So now here's even further west. Uh, we have the western black-legged tick, Ixodes specific. So in the east, we have the black-legged tick. And in the west, they have the western black-legged tick. They're very similar. So that transmits Lyme disease, Borrelia myomotui, anaplasmosis or lichiosis, babesiosis, rickettsiosis, and Powassan virus. Then there's the Pacific Coast tick, and you can see on the map where that's located, the dark green spots there. Um, and that transmits Rocky Mountain spotted fever, tularemia, and something called Pacific Coast tick fever, 364D rickettsiosis. It's also called rickettsia philippii. It seems like California and the CDC call it by two different names. Now this tick I'm bringing up 
I wish I didn't have to bring it up, but I do. Uh, it's an invasive species that came to this country from Asia in 2017. And unfortunately for me, I live in New Jersey. It was uh, found on a New Jersey farm on a sheep in 2017. And uh, they found a huge tick infestation and multiple life stages on a sheep with no travel history. So the basic thing about this, it did winter over, which was bad news. They were hoping it would die. And uh, invasive populations like this that come in are almost exclusively parthenogenetic, meaning they can reproduce without a male. So this tick can reproduce without having a male. So as of 2022, the tick is now confirmed in 17 states. And that little tiny red state down there that I tried to bring out is Pennsylvania, unfortunately for you. So now we know that we do have them in, in quite a number of states already. Now this tick, the government hasn't reported any disease cases for humans to date. Uh, however, in Asia, where it came from, China, Japan, Australia, it definitely could transmit and has and does transmit uh, diseases, including spotted fever, rickettsiosis in these countries. However, we now know that in this country, uh, I, I did a little bit of a pathogen update, the Bourbon virus has been detected in this longicornis tick in several Virginia counties already, and one tick tested positive in a Pennsylvania study for Borrelia burgdorferi. Now, what is it doing well, since it's not feeding on humans? Well, it's actually feeding on cows and other kinds of farm animals, and it's killing them. They die by exsanguination. They, they, it just sucks every, the blood out of them. And uh, they, you, they can find more than a thousand ticks on these cows. I've seen the uh, videos that certain entities have done, and it's absolutely amazing. These ticks swarm in these places by the thousands. So, According to the Pennsylvania Department of Health, three medically important ticks in Pennsylvania and their associated diseases, American dog tick uh, and that spotted fever rickettsiosis, lone star tick, ehrlichia, star eye, tularemia, and the alpha-gal allergy, black-legged tick, Lyme disease, babesiosis, ehrlichiosis, anaplasmosis, Borrelia myomotoi. And there was a study, 117 year retrospective analysis of Pennsylvania ticks. They identified 24 species of ticks in Pennsylvania. Now I'm a native Pennsylvanian and we had ticks when I lived there, but I'm gonna tell you, not that many. <laughs> Pike County, Pennsylvania tick studies. Now the Lyme Disease Association, we provided a grant to Pike County and they did a baseline study testing the deer ticks for Borrelia burgdorferi and also for Bartonella. For the burgdorferi, 39% were infected. For Bartonella, 18.5% were infected. Now, we also provided them with another grant in 2021, and they screened for five tick-borne pathogens. And the, there's adult and nymph, but I'm going to just read the adult, the Borrelia burgdorferi causing Lyme. Almost 46% were infected. The anaplasma phagocytophyllum, 12%. Babesia microti, almost 5%. Borrelia myomotai, 1.38%. Powassan virus lineage, the deer tick virus, 2%. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about symptom-wise, Lyme disease that you know, and I'll explain that a little bit later. So <clears throat> early on, first we know it's transmitted by the black-legged or deer tick and the western black-legged ticks out west caused by Borrelia burgdorferi, in this case. Uh, symptoms, early flu-like illness, muscle aches, pains, joint pain, and or swelling, fatigue, malaise, fever, headache. Now, possible rash. 
And this is really important because everyone thinks you have to have a rash, not true. And the bullseye only presents about 9% of the time. That's the actual bullseye. But that bullseye is a subset of the EM rash, which is uh, the CDC says in 60% of patients, 60 to 80%. However, uh, a lot of researchers and most of the Lyme organizations and others uh, have found that through research that it, we feel it's less than 50%, but we're giving you what the CDC says. And a lot of that is because they use the rash in a lot of their case determinations. So they probably see it a lot more. So um, <clears throat> anyway, later symptoms that can attack all systems in the body. And of course, there's varying testing methods for it. And the treatment generally, at least in the beginning, is doxycycline. Now, this is some of the different Lyme rashes, so you get an idea what some of them could look like. Remember, not everybody gets one of any kind. They can look different than the classic bullseye, and they can be on other places on your body than the bite site because that's disseminated disease. Now, this is a, a Columbia University rash poster. We funded this project, and you can find it and print it from our website if you want it uh, to make it larger, whatever. But that shows you some of the different ones. That top left-hand corner, that is a, that's the classic bullseye because it's, see that central clearing? That's what the classic bullseye has. The rest of them are EMs, but they may not be, uh, you know, they may not be um, classic bullseye. That seems to be a bullseye. That's probably considered a bullseye. So signs and symptoms of Lyme. And again, I, I will note this cardiac poster that's right there, uh, that can be downloaded for free from our website and printed. And so musculoskeletal symptoms joint pain or swelling, stiffness, muscle pain, migrating muscle pain, cramps, shin splints, neck or back stiffness, joint pain and or swelling, or cramps that may migrate, TMJ, neck creaks and cracks, tender soles of your feet, reproductive, testicular pain, pelvic pain, menstrual irregularity, unexplained milk production, sexual dysfunction, or loss of libido. The cardiac pulmonary, chest pain or rib soreness, shortness of breath, heart palpitations, pulse skips, heart block, heart murmur, valve prolapse, and I want to mention there have been cardiac deaths. Lyme signs and symptoms number three, neurological, muscle twitching, headache, tingling, numbness, burning or stabbing sensations, facial paralysis, dizziness, poor balance, increased motion sickness, lightheadedness, wooziness, difficulty walking, tremor, confusion, difficulty thinking, concentrating, reading, forgetfulness, poor short-term memory, disorientation, getting lost, going to the wrong place. Um, and I just want to give a quick example of this. I've known professional people, parked their car, gone into work, came out, um, uh, didn't know what car they'd driven and couldn't find it in parking lot then couldn't get home when they did find it. Difficulty with speech, double or blurry vision, eye pain, blindness, increased floaters, increased sensitivity to light or sound or smell, buzzing or ringing in ears, ear pain, decreased hearing or deafness, seizure activity, white matter lesions, low blood pressure. And I do wanna mention my own daughter, uh, she was out of school for four full years, two partial years. For three years straight, she was in temporal lobe seizures, uh, six out of every seven days a week for three years straight. It was, it was a complete nightmare. Lyme signs and symptoms number four, neuropsychiatric, mood swings, irritability, depression, disturbed sleep, personality changes, OCD, violent outbursts, anorexia, panoroi, uh, panoro paranoia, panic anxiety attacks, hallucinations, gastrointestinal problems, nausea or vomiting, loss of appetite, GERD, change in bowel function, gastritis, abnormal cramping, cystitis, irritable bladder or bowel dysfunction, newly diagnosed irritable bowel. 
other fever, sweats, chills, weight change, fatigue, tiredness, hair loss, swollen glands, sore throat, difficulty swallowing, swelling around eyes and swelling of feet. Now, this is Lyme disease you may not know, Borrelia from caused by Borrelia maionii. And it's found right now mostly in the upper Midwest, transmitted by the black-legged tick. Uh, and symptoms, early symptoms, fever, headache, rash, neck pain, later stages arthritis. And some of the differences from Borrelia burgdorferi Lyme may include nausea and vomiting, more diffuse rashes, and a higher concentration of bacteria in the blood. You may know that when you get Lyme with Borrelia burgdorferi, there's very low, uh, it's very low, often not even found in the blood because it's so low concentration, where it's 180 fold higher in a Borrelia maonii, but it's, this seems to be so far that it's not as quite an intense disease. Uh, it is found in animal populations in the Midwest um, and in other places. And there is a testing currently, unfortunately it's not specific, um, but a lot of docs use the current Lyme testing since it resembles the Lyme from Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, and the treatment is again, uh, the docs tend to use uh, the doxycycline. Now, co-infections, one tick bite can cause more than one disease. So some of the, these are the kinds of diseases that the deer tick or the black-legged tick, again, same thing, can transmit, can carry and transmit Borrelia burgdorferi or maonii, producing Lyme, Babesia anaplasma, Ehrlichia bartonella, Borrelia myomotui, Powassan virus, tick paralysis toxin. So the other tick-borne diseases may have similar symptoms as Lyme, but they may have different treatments. And it's important to know you can be infected in one bite more, with many of these. Anaplasmosis and ehrlichiosis. So anaplasmosis symptoms, again, it is transmitted by the Ixodes scapularis, which is the deer tick, and Ixodes pacificus, which is the Western black-legged tick, same, basically, they're almost the same. Symptoms onset generally begins within a week of a tick bite, early signs, fever, headaches, malaise, muscle pains, chill, nausea, and vomiting. If treatment is delayed or other medical conditions are present, it can cause a very severe illness and age is a huge risk factor. Older you are, the bigger the risk. So signs of symptoms of severe late stage, respiratory, bleeding, organ failure, and death. There are tests for it and uh, treatment is doxycycline. In rare cases, it can be spread by blood transfusions. And the little note in red says, in 2013, anaplasmosis was in double digits in Pennsylvania for the first time, reported. In 2021, there are already 600 plus cases of Lyme disease. And that was, they were diagnosed by Hershey in, in a study in 2021. So it's on the rise, folks. Ehrlichiosis caused by Ehrlichia chaffiensis bacteria, that's transmitted by the Lone Star, caused by Ehrlichia owengii, transmitted by the Lone Star, caused by Ehrlichia muris urcolorensis, that's transmitted by the, the black-legged or a deer tick. And there are tests for those, symptoms and treatment, fever, chills, headache, muscle aches, sometimes upset stomach, doxycycline for all ages, and Ehrlichia can be spread through blood transfusion and organ transplant in rare cases. Now, babesiosis, this is one of the most common co-infections with Lyme, and it's a parasite, and it can be transmitted through the blood supply. So the FDA finally approved tests uh, in, in 2018 and 19 to screen the blood supply for a number of different uh, strains of, of the Babesia. And in rare cases, 
there can be can congenital transmission. And there are uh, a tests to diagnose, and it can be particularly fatal to the elderly or those with no spleen. And those having a Lyme co-infection can have more serious symptoms. And there were over 14,000 reported cases from 2011 to 2019. And those cases are going up. You can see a map there from CMS uh, from 2006 to 2013. Of course, there's a lot of more spread now uh, of that disease. Now, Borrelia myomotoi disease, that's caused by another spirochete-shaped bacteria closely related to the relapsing fever group of Borrelia, and it's more distantly related to Borrelia that causes Lyme disease, transmitted again, black-legged tick, western black-legged tick. Now, these symptoms, as its name might imply, the relapsing fever group, may be recurring the fever. Headaches, chills, body and joint pain, fatigue, arthralgia, myalgia, uncommon uh, symptoms, dizziness, confusion, vertigo, dyspnea, nausea, abdominal pain, diarrhea, anorexia. So usually the fevers last approximately three days, and then they're separated by a, a febrile period of seven days duration. There are different testings available. And treatment is doxycycline. And then, of course, there's a number of other antibiotics there. Now, according to a PA Health Department advisory in 2022, Borrelia myomotoi disease has been detected in multiple Pennsylvania residents. Healthcare providers should consider it in patients presenting with compatible symptoms. Now, this is Powassan virus. Only they only address the neuroinvasive cases here. There are cases that are not neuroinvasive. They were these were reported by the state of residence, and you can see that uh, this is from 2012 to 2021. And you see that Pennsylvania during that time had nine cases. Uh, it is on the, the rise. Um, it's caused by the bite of ticks primarily found in the eastern half, particularly the black-legged ticks. There's a couple of others that generally don't bite humans, but they could, and rarely through blood transfusions. Now, the, the important, couple important, very important things about this one, the transmission time of this virus can be as soon as 15 minutes after tick attachment. Now, the initial symptoms, headache, fever, nausea, vomiting, generalized weakness. It can, can, can progress to encephalitis, meningoencephalitis, aseptic men menge yeah, meninge yeah, meningitis, sorry about that. Symptoms of encephalitis may include altered mental status, seizure, speech problems, uh, per paresis or paralysis, movement disorders, and cranial nerve palsies. Now, encephalitis and meningitis, in those cases, if it does infect those, death occurs in about 10%. And this is very important, 50% of the survivors have long-lasting neurologic deficits. So there's a very serious disease, folks. Now, the treatment, unfortunately, there's only supportive treatment available, and those with severe disease are often hospitalized. Now, there are some tests out there, and the ones I've highlighted are some specialized one that the CDC has available, uh, and some of the state labs might have available in a few reference labs. Now, the CDC website in 2023 says, Preliminary diagnosis is based on the patient's clinical signs and symptoms, location where infection likely occurred, uh, activities leading to risk of possible exposure to the virus, primarily through exodes species ticks or rarely through blood transfusions. Now, Bartonellosis, transmission, fleas, lice, sand flies, cat scratches and bites, cat saliva, or broken skin or mucosal surfaces. 
Now it can be carried by Ixodes scapularis, the black-legged or deer tick. And uh, it is certainly found in Pennsylvania and in New Jersey. Now the CDC knows it can be carried by ticks, but they don't want to yet say that it's transmitted by ticks. Although again, many doctors and researchers feel it is. CDC's position is in red. Ticks may carry some species of Bartonella bacteria. There is currently no causal evidence that ticks can transmit Bartonella infection to people through tick bites. Many of the treating physicians find that uh, many of their patients have Bartonella simultaneously to uh, Lyme, and they're not necessarily cat owners. <clears throat> When symptoms are present in combination with Lyme, a typical present presentations may result, including visual problems, headaches, significant lymph node enlargement, resistant neurological deficits, new onset seizure disorders. There are tests and there are treatments, um, and there's a number of them listed there that you can find. <clears throat> Now, southern tick-associated rash illness, star eye, that's transmitted by the bite of the lone star tick, Amblyona americanum, and it's also known as master's disease. Now, the infectious cause is unknown. They used to say it was caused by Borrelia lone star eye, uh, and which is similar to uh, the other Borrelias, but then they decided it wasn't. So it looks and acts like Lyme. It, has, it can have an EM-like rash, a red expanding bullseye lesion at the bite site, which could appear within seven to 10 days. Uh, you may get fatigue, headache, fever, muscle and joint pains. There's not a specific test for it. Um, it's diagnosed by symptoms, geography, tick bite. Tre CDC says in the cases of star eye studied to date, the rash and accompanying symptoms have resol resolved following treatment with an oral antibiotic, doxycycline, but it's unknown whether this medication speeds recovery. So basically what they're doing is covering themselves. They're saying, we don't really know this, but that's basically what doctors are giving. Now, Q fever. Q fever is caused by Coxiella burnetti bacteria but it's transmitted most often by inhaling CB containing dust or eating or drinking contaminating food, contaminated foods. Cattle, sheep, and goats are the main reservoirs. Other forms of transmission are rare, but include tick bites and human to human transmission. Now in red, I put the CDC does not indicate it's a tick-borne disease on its tick-borne disease website. However, the CDC says on its public health imaging website, which shows up all the images for ticks, et cetera, that the sheep tick is a known vector for Q fever. So I guess that's what you call having it both ways. So the symptoms, high fever, severe headache, malaise, myalgia, chills and or sweats, cough, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, chest pain. There are tests for it. Um, there are treatment. 50% of cases required hospitalization. Doxy is one of the treatments, hydroxy, another one. Uh, chronic Q fever, multiple drugs are used. Um, in case numbers in 2019, there were 178 acute cases, 34 chronic, and those have been on the rise. And CDC has noted it has been previously weaponized for use in biological warfare and is considered a potential terrorist threat. Now, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, that's transmitted by the American dog tick, wood tick, and brown dog ticks. And the lone star tick can carry, but again, as I pointed out, the transmission is unsettled. CDC doesn't say that the lone star transmits, but it can carry. There has been one case of uh, published the lone star transmission. Symptoms include fever, headache, myalgia, characteristic rash on wrists, ankles, and soles, 
and you can see some of that rash on, on the pictures if you uh, want to look at them later when you go online. This will be put online so you'll be able to see everything. Treatment is doxy. Uh, CDC says in clinical reviews, there's a 5 to 10% mortality rate. Now there has a lot of published literature with higher rates and Dantas Taurus in Lancet in 2007 used a 20% figure. Now in the HHS Tick-Borne Disease Working Group to Congress, uh, and I was on that working group for uh, two terms, that was four years, um, we, one of the recommendations we made to Congress was to improve provider recognition and empiric treatment of Rocky Mountains and also other spotted fevers at early stages of illness. That's because of the fatality rate with using doxy, doxy including in children younger than eight. And CDC definitely says now, because of before, you probably know that they did not recommend that. They do recommend that now for that. Now, tularemia, this is a map showing 2011 to 2019 cases. Again, there were 13 in Pennsylvania. Now, this is transmitted by the bite of the tick or the deer fly. And uh, the ticks include the American dog tick, the Rocky Mountain wood tick, the Lone Star tick. It's not transmitted, or at least not that they know about right now, by the black-legged tick. So there are two types that are tick-borne out of six total types. Um, and symptoms of the tick-borne tularemia, a skin ulcer where the bacteria entered the body, there may, it may or may not be present. The ulcer will be accompanied by regional lymph glands, usually armpit or groin. And there are tests that, that may, they may vary by the type of exposure to the tularemia. There are treatments. There's a number of different ones down there. And uh, CDC notes people could be exposed as a result of viral terrorism. Tick-borne relapsing fever, 1990 to 2011. Now, this is mostly, you can see, in uh, the Western United States. And these, this is transmitted by the Ornithodorus ticks, the soft body. And I mentioned all the other talks, ticks we talked about, hard body. The soft body tick is a, a nasty little creature that hides in animal burrows. It's found in old cabins in the West, caves in Texas, usually at high altitudes. They feed at night, have a very short feeding period. They usually feed on people and animals when they're asleep. And they can live up to 10 years or more. And the female passes the Borrelia to its eggs, which then goes into the next tick. So the Pacific Coast tick fever, that's transmitted by the Pacific Coast tick and caused by Rickettsia species 364D. And the treatment is doxy, as is with most of the spotted fever infections. And spotted fevers in general can range from mild to life-threatening. And of course, I mentioned the Rocky Mountain, which does have a pretty high fatality rate. And symptoms, most spotted fever patients other than Rocky Mountain will have an s -jar, fever, headache, and a rash. Now, heartland virus, that's transmitted by the bite of an infected tit, thought to be the Lone Star. And that's mostly right at the moment, at least in uh, these particular states that are mostly in the South. Symptoms, fever, fatigue, loss of appetite, headache, nausea, diarrhea, muscle or joint pain. Many people are hospitalized. There are testing to be performed at CDC only, and the healthcare providers are told to contact their state health department. Treatment, supportive care only, and some deaths have resulted. Now, the heart, the bourbon virus, again, named after a county in, in Kansas, transmitted by the bite of an infected tick, thought to be the Lone Star, Symptoms, fever, tiredness, rash, headache, other body aches, nausea, vomiting, uh, low blood cell counts for cells that fight infection and help prevent bleeding. Uh, 
Testing and treatment, yes, there are, are molecular and serologic blood tests available and some at CDC. There's only symptomatic treatment. So what is the controversy? You may have heard about the controversy for Lyme disease. It's simplified right here that do patients continue to have symptoms? Do they have an active infection? Is it autoimmune combination of both? Some identifiers I have seen used are chronic Lyme, persistent Lyme, post-Lyme syndrome, post-Lyme disease syndrome, post-treatment Lyme, post-treatment Lyme disease, post-treatment Lyme syndrome, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, ad infinitum. If you've forgotten your Latin, it's to infinity. IDSA versus the treatment I, that's treatment guidelines. So the IDSA is the Infectious Diseases Society of America. They have guidelines out and the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society has treatment guidelines. They're competing guidelines. They're both medical societies. Basically, this is a chart that we put into the 2020 re working group uh, to con and report to Congress, and it compares the two guidelines. But the basic bottom line is that the IDSA does not believe that there is a such thing as chronic Lyme, and their treatments tend to uh, not uh, give the clinician as much leeway, and they don't provide for longer-term treatment. The ILADS guidelines, uh, those docs are a lot of the docs that treat Lyme across the country and recognize and feel that there is something going on uh, with long-term symptoms um, and that people often may need treatment, longer-term treatment. And so they, can, they make a clinical diagnosis. So you can look at that chart later if you're interested to see the other kinds of uh, you know, comparisons. Now, byline data patient registry, this we put into our HHS working group report to Congress in 2020. There were over 12,000 patients enrolled. So how long until the patients were diagnosed? This is amazing, folks. 16% under four months, 12% five to 11 months, 17% one to two years, 20% two to six years, 36% six years. So in summary, 84% were not diagnosed within the first four months. 72% saw four or more docs before diagnosis. Of course, unfortunately, this all leads to chronic illness. Call it what you will out of some of those descriptors that I mentioned. 72% are misdiagnosed as psychiatric, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, thyroid, rheumatoid, uh, MS, lupus, learning disabilities, Parkinson's, ALS, et cetera. So cases of post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. Now, post-treatment Lyme disease is a, a, a uh, it was something that was coined by researchers so that they could do research. They needed to have a name for this type of entity since there isn't a specific diagnosis for the symptoms after treatment. So studies have shown that Lyme treatment failure rates from, at, from regular IDSA type prescribed treatment short term, 10 to 20%. Some studies indicate more Lyme patients fail treatment, more than the 10 to 20 percent. A Hopkins study showed up to 35 percent of patients experience chronic, often debilitating symptoms after treatment. Now, Lyme and its sequelae are responsible for a significant numbers of school and work absences are estimated to cost more than a billion a year for health care in U.S., and if you're interested in, in statistics on prevalence, uh, you can take a look at that study later. Again, all the things are cited, so you can find it if you want to. Persistent chronic Lyme is supported by scientific research. Right now, for the last couple of years, there's been research on persisters. Uh, and what are persisters? Um, they're bacterial cells that escape effects of antibiotics. They go dormant when treated with antibiotics, yet they can grow again. 
Um, and these persisters don't grow in the presence of antibiotics. So the disease can flare up again when the treatment stops. Biofilms, biofilms are colonies of bacteria encased in slime that act as one entity and they're highly resistant to antibiotics and host defense. Now there are animal studies and Dr. Stephen Barthold, one of the premier researchers, he's now retired, in the field of Lyme, a veterinarian testified before the House Foreign Affairs Health Subcommittee in 2012. With the advent of increasing sensitive PCR analysis, we and others have repeatedly demonstrated in dogs, mice, and uh, rhesus macaque monkeys that non-culturable spirochetes persist following antibiotic treatment. And those are the studies the mouse and the monkeys and the dogs listed there. I also testified at that hearing. And there was a xenodiagnosis uh, study in humans. Actually, that was uh, Adriana Marquez from the NIH. And people actually allowed themselves to be bitten by these ticks, which uh, were had been given uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. And the xenodiagnosis was positive in, in two instances. So what the problem, part of the problem is that missing the CDC, misusing CDC surveillance case definition, uh, it's not meant to be used for diagnosis. It should not be used to establish clinical diagnosis, standard of care, guidelines for quality, providing standards of reimbursement. Uh, what's been happening in practice is actually that has been used by doctors, by insurers, by medical boards to go after doctors who are treating. Now there's a, a new uh, 2022 Lyme surveillance guidelines. They were originally using 2017. And in the new ones, the case definition says it's intended solely for public health surveillance purposes does not recommend diagnostic criteria for clinical partners to utilize in diagnosing patients with potential Lyme disease. There's also more uh, choices of testing in there. Differential diagnosis, Lyme can mimic other things, MS, ALS, CFS, FM, rheumatoid, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, lupus, autism, ADD, ADHD, psychiatric conditions. Doctors need to see if Lyme is causing these clusters and treat it if it's that causing it. Lyme in the kids, uh, there's Columbia University studies showing children uh, with Lyme had significantly more cognitive and psychiatric disturbances, but when they, they uh, controlled for anxiety, depression, and fatigue, the, the cognitive deficits were still there. And uh, they were accompanied by long-term neuropsychiatric disturbances resulting in psychosocial and academic impairment. And parents indicated 41% of children had suicidal thoughts and 11% made suicidal gesture. And an important study by uh, Dr. Fallon at Columbia under diagnosis showed that there was a study a documented IQ improvement of 22 points in a 16-year-old after IV treatment for Lyme disease. So why do children in schools have problems? Because Lyme can affect all the symptoms of the body. The symptoms are varied. They often exhibit problems associated with Lyme, especially behavioral and mood changes that don't go recognized by districts. Children may be improperly classified, labeled neurologically impaired, emotionally disturbed, when perhaps a classification include other health impaired might be more appropriate. Um, the children may be identified with ADD, medicated for those symptoms, no causes ever sought. So why do schools question Lyme? Fluctuation in and variety of symptoms. They can vary from day to day, hour to hour. Sleep disturbances may cause a child to oversleep in the morning because of difficulty falling asleep at night. Executive functioning may be impaired. They may have difficulty organizing day or life. Recurrent short-term memory, concentration, and recall problems. Mental confusion, exhibition of dyslexic type symptoms that interfere with learning process. Forgetting books and homework, especially in middle or high school. A CDC New Jersey School District's Lyme study, which I helped to initiate uh, by the CDC, the median duration of Lyme at the time of interview was 363 days. 
Median number of days the illness was said to significantly affect normal activities, 293 days. Mean number of total school days lost, 140. Mean duration of home instruction, 153. Only 26% of children in the study were said to have fully recovered. Direct medical costs totaled $5.2 million. That was adjusted to 8.7 for 2013 dollars. Uh, and there's a, a quote there from the superintendent. It basically said, my superintendent in particular, that the uh, the greatest costs incurred by the study children were social costs of the illness and treatment. Schooling and extracurricular learning activities were seriously interrupted for most children. Student evaluation. So to ensure problems are not organically produced by Lyme, districts, parents, doctors need to carefully evaluate any child with a history of Lyme experiencing neurologic, psychiatric, or attention deficit problems. And the bacteria causing the disease can enter the central nervous system less than a day after a chick bite. Additionally, the role of co-infections, diseases transmitted by the same ticks needs to be examined. Now, these suggestions are based, I was a, a, an advocate, have been in the schools many times for Lyme over the decades, and children experience what I call transitory learning disabilities, since they may vary year to year, month to month, day to day. So these possibilities have to be built into an IEP, since conditions change so frequently. Now, a child may require home instruction, special instruction, be in a regular classroom, or maybe on home instruction and in school part-time at the same time. IEPs often need to contain provisions for instruction over holidays, weekends, and the summer, since teachable moments are unpredictable. Provisos need to be made for students on long-term home instruction to attend schools for special events, lunch, or even just a class visit to break up the isolation. I can't tell you how hard it was on my daughter four years out and two partial years. Often students can only take core course subjects because they need to conserve all their strength to guess, get out of bed and complete those subjects. Quality versus quantity. Students who have the ability to take honors or advanced placement are often discouraged from doing so. There was a, a, a young man who probably was in the genius category with his his IQ, and the district was refusing to allow him to take AP. They gave me all kinds of excuses. The bottom line, he was finally able to, went on to a prestigious college. He ended up teaching the professors. So possible modifications, oral tests, break up instructional periods, extend assignment times, extend test times, testing over several day period, well, I said tape books and lectures. Of course, we now have the internet, didn't have them when I first started with this. Access textbooks for the blind, assignment reinforcement, extra set of books students need to move around, address sound sensitivity problems, change seatings, sometimes quality versus quantity, again, especially with honors or AP. Let them go to the nurse. We had one district refuse to allow a child, it was, it was terrible, to go to the nurse when that child was sick. They eventually got themselves in a ton of trouble for not doing that. Shorten school day, home instruction. Policy revisions, activities or attendance policies. They often forbid attendance at activities after or during an absence, but because kids with a chronic condition, they don't fit into any existing paradigm. They may be out of school for extended periods. They may be capable of attending a particular event. So you need to give them that ability. So homework policy, sometimes they set a length of absence required before homework is sent home because of unpredictability of symptoms and frequent and sometimes short absences, students with Lyme disease homework needs to be supplied without any waiting period. 
outdoor class trip policies. This is important for the students, the staff and the district because there was a, a legal case that was involved with this that districts should include information about the dangers of Lyme, thus protecting staff, children and unnecessary exposure to the disease and the district from unnecessary expense in litigation. Now, these are some of the resources that the LDA has on its website. You can find them there. I think they're basically all free. Uh, maybe the book is still $10 or something, but I, I don't know. We might have a free version up there. That was written and edited by two uh, young women who had Lyme disease. Uh, my daughter, as a matter of fact, was an editor because she eventually uh, was editing a peer review journals uh, as a living. Um, and we have the great ABCs of Lyme disease that we could send you for free and other uh, kinds of things that are free on our website. Legislation in Congress. Last Congress, we had something that would uh, we helped initiate and write the bill that would amend the IDEA by specifically adding, including Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases under health impairments. Unfortunately, last Congress was very busy. We didn't, we weren't able to get it in uh, the vote up. Uh, but my congressman, Congressman Chris Smith, who chairs the Lyme Caucus, uh, he's going to try to get it introduced in this year again. We did have the working group, which we were successful in getting legislation to uh, seat this working group in Congress that allowed patients uh, as well as treating physicians and people with different viewpoints to sit on the working group and make the decisions uh, that affected Lyme disease. Prior to that time, it had only been government representatives that sat on a working group and made all the decisions. So we were able to make the decisions and report to Congress three times over the life of the working group, which just expired. Um, the, one of the recommendations was to, for the NIH to create a st to strategic plan, which we found out <laughs> sitting on the working group in 2020, they didn't have one. Um, and so they did take action after that to develop a strategic plan for Lyme. There's also something called LIMEX, where Health and Human Services and the Cohen Foundation, which is one of the largest providers of private monies for Lyme research, uh, have a, a, a partnership together. Now, PA Lyme legislation, you probably know about SB 232, uh, which will, is all about tick removal in the schools uh, and the requirements about school nurse, physician, or designated employee shall remove a tick from school student in accordance with the Secretary of Health guidelines that will be in this um, legislation and it requires parental notification, requires the school to preserve the tick and then either the school or the parent can send it in. Now it did pass the Senate 49 to one on April 26 and now it will move further in along the uh, process to see if it gets uh, finally a, a totally approved as law. So in the bottom line, can we escape ticks? Well, the, if you can see the red print in there uh, and the if you can see the globe, that's the bottom of the globe. And the, in sub-Antarctic uh, hemisphere, just north of the Antarctic Circle, there's two island groups and the zoonosis Lyme disease caused by the spirochete Borrelia burgdorferi is carried by seabirds transmitted by Exodes ticks it's been found through DNA analysis in ticks on these islands. King penguins on these islands have antibodies to Borrelia burgdorferi. We're talking about some sub-Antarctic folks. This is an engorged nymphal amblyoma tick, which was found in the Dominican Republic 15 to 45 million years ago. And basically, it contains something that's uh, out of the Babesia family. This is an Australian tick, in case you think we're the only ones barraged with these suckers. From 2019, this tick had 500 ticks plus 
on it in somebody's pool in Australia. They brought in the Brisbane snake catcher who counted the ticks and rescued the snake. One of my favorite posts is from Insectropolis. I don't know if you've ever been there in New Jersey. It's a great place for not only adults, but especially for kids. This is wanted dead or alive, AKA the deer tick, thousand dollars reward. And I know most of us would pay more than that. Down on the Mexican border, the USDA actually has these riders who patrol the border because what happens is cows and other animals come across the Mexican border and the cows in particular need to be captured. They're inspected for ticks and run through spray boxes or submerged in these vats with this corral because unfortunately the Babesia for decades and decades going back was killing our cattle coming in. So prevention, why do rhinoceroses have it easy? Well, they have tick birds that get on their back and eat the ticks off. So who protects us? Well, unfortunately we're responsible for our own actions. Pants and socks, long sleeve shirts, light colored clothing, shoes and socks, hats and tuck and hair, Full body tick checks, that's the most important. Remove ticks promptly and properly. Put your clothes in the dryer at least 35 minutes to kill the ticks when you come in. Uh, there are special rhino skin tick prevention clothings that are chemical free. Insect shield repellent apparel that where it's, uh, this is dipped already before you buy the clothing. Um, there are sprays for your skin and your clothes, and you should never substitute one for the other. There is a current Lyme vaccine trial with Valneva and, and Pfizer. Uh, Pfizer shut down part of this trial recently. Uh, the Lyme community and many researchers have problems with this, this Lyme vaccine. It has the same base as the Lyme vaccine that was pulled from the market the Lyme vaccine in the early 2000s, the Lyme rink vaccine. And so that is a concern. It has the OSPE based. So the, there's a Mardina MRA vaccine. You might remember the MRA vaccines from them for COVID. Well, just like a week or two ago, they announced their first uh, Medina vaccines for Lyme disease. They have two candidates, one that would be effective against Borrelia in the US and the other for Borrelia in Europe. Of course, it's not out on the market, it's under development. Getting rid of ticks, this is my absolute favorite ticks. This is a fungus for tick control. You can use it out in your garden. It is on the market. And with it just less than a week ago, oral vaccine from US Biologic got a conditional USD license. This is for mice and it's pellets. You put it out in your backyard. The mice can consume it and then it stops the bacteria inside the mice. And so then the ticks biting them are not going to get viable bacteria. There's other kinds of research going on with different kinds of acaricides, meaning that ticks are killed. Uh, there's one that a new one that they're looking at essential oil from balsam fern needles and, and other essential oils. There's other kinds. And in the bottom line, you got to love those opossums because they can kill about 5,000 ticks a season. More than 90% of the ticks picked up by it are swallowed and killed. And I thank you very much for your attention and I thank everybody involved uh, and uh, especially you, you guys for coming and hearing this and the school district uh, for having this.